Now, continuing where we left off, we'll continue our discussion on angiosperms by entitling the next flowchart Angiosperms 2. And right where we left off, we still have one more part of the flower structure to look at. So we'll just finish off and continue the look at flowers, which are those specialized reproductive structures that all angiosperms have. And this will be flowers continued since we're uh, going off of what we've already built. So we've covered three major parts of the flower organs. There are four floral organs to know. The final one is going to be the carpal. So previously, what we looked at was the stamen. And so over there, what we were looking basically at was the male side of the story. Here in the carpal side of the story, we're going to now sort of be looking at the female version that all angiosperms, flowering plants, have within them as well. So male and female parts on this very specialized reproductive flower. So the carpal is going to be the location that produces, if it's female, it would produce megaspores not microspores like the male counterpart, and thus those megaspores will eventually develop into the reproductive structures necessary for the continuance of their lives, the plant's life, which would be the female gametophyte. So the male gametophyte forms out of the microspores, just like we've been saying over and over and over again, and the megaspores are going to eventually develop into female gametophytes. Okay, so that's our sort of story of the carpal. Now, the carpal is more so going to be referred to as the container. That's really what it directly translates to, as the container of the plant, because this is where we're going to ultimately have the fact that seeds are enclosed here. Seeds are a big part of angiosperm life cycle, a huge part. And this is such a huge part, this container, this carpal, that this is going to be considered the key, the absolute key structure that distinguishes. It's the key structure that distinguishes two things that we've studied thus far in this lecture, that distinguishes both the, the gymnosperms from what we're studying right now versus the angio. So I just wrote gymno versus angio. The reason why it's distinguished is because gymnosperms, they don't have this, okay? They don't have. And angiosperms do have a container, a carpal, a flower. Gymnosperms do not. That's the big difference, the big differentiator. The other parts, sometimes gymnosperms can have remnants of, but they certainly do not have a specialized, specific carpal region and part to in their overall plant anatomy. So that's a big thing here to remember. The container is the distinguisher between gymno versus angiosperms. Okay. In addition, some plants may have single or sometimes even multiple carpals, depending on the plant type in question. So you may have single or multiple carpals, DEP for dependent on plant type. So that's just based off of what species you're looking at, essentially. You may have one or more carpals. And now finally, in terms of the carpal, what we're going to be concluding our study is on the fact that it consists of three major parts that are very important in understanding the overall success of angiosperms and their specialized reproductive capabilities. Those three parts are as follows. The first part to understand is the stigma. The stigma is often just referred to as the sticky tip. Sticky stigma is a very easy way to remember this structure. Now, this sticky tip part of the carpal, of the female part of the flower structure that is a modified sporophyll overall, is going to be very important because this is going to be sticky for a very critical reason. This is exactly where the plant specifically receives, the plant receives pollen here. And the pollen is going to be specifically received here because it sticks here as well. So it receives pollen and it sticks here. That's the purpose of the stigma. And the pollen is, of course, coming from either a different plant or sometimes even the same plant. But most of the time, we're actually going to be seeing that it's going to come from a different plant. It's going to be wind dispersed or animal dispersed, as we'll see when we move forward with the life cycle. Another part of the carpal to understand is the style, S-T-Y-L-E. The style is going to be the specific structure of the carpal that leads 
from this sticky stigma structure to the ovary. So we have this sort of pathway, this highway, that the pollen needs to take. It needs to go down the style structure in order to enter the ovary structure. And that's, of course, our final part of the carpal. The ovary structure is going to be where one or more ovules will be located. So we have one or more ovules. And now, so if we have ovules within an ovary, within a carpal, that's our sort of uh, hierarchical organization, the ovules that we have here are going to be important because ovules are going to be fertilized. Okay, this is where the site of fertilization will be. So the ovule will be fertilized so long as we have a successful pollen grain infiltrate and get into the ovary structure. And once it's fertilized, this is where we eventually have the development of becoming a seed. It becomes a seed. This ovule structure literally completes and turns around its entire life cycle to become a seed. And that's going to be the premise of everything that angiosperms really are, seed plants that grow on land, as we'll see when we look at the life cycle in greater detail. So keep these terms in mind. I'm going to be using them a lot as we go through the life cycle and continuing through angiosperm studying. Okay, so we have the basic four parts of a flower now, the floral organs, the modified leaves of the flower structure that's found within angiosperms. Now we can talk a little bit more uh, generally speaking. Uh, more specific, or more generally speaking, what we say is that a complete flower, so this is a different topic sort of, a complete flower is one that has all four floral organs. Four floral organs. Organs. So that's what the terminology comes from. A complete flower has four floral organs. Carpal, stamen, uh, it has the carpal, it has the stamen, it has the petals, and it has the sepals. Okay. Versus an incomplete flower, which is exactly what you would guess it would be. An incomplete flower is one that does not have all floor. So it's an incomplete flower if it, has, uh, if it lacks one or more. Is equal to lacks one or more of those structures. All right? Still an angiosperm, so long as it's part of the you know, anthophyta phylum, but it's an incomplete flower in terms of that specific structure devoted to sexual reproduction. Finally, last thing about angiosperms too that we'll look at is a very broad and brief look at the diversity of angiosperms. Their diversity is basically uh, uh, established on the fact that they're going to have a variety of different colors, different structures overall in terms of the flower, even even different odors. Sometimes angiosperms have a pleasant odor, sometimes less than pleasant, etc. All of these things, very important adaptive qualities that are going to differentiate angiosperms from one another. Basically, what we state is the fact that the color, the structure, the odor, whatever it may be, the purpose and sort of way that this happens, this diversity happens, is through adaptation, of course. But specifically, these fl flowers, their job is to adapt to the specific environment that they're in. More specifically, adapt to the specific pollinators. So the pollinators, let's say the bees, if they enjoy a flower that is of yellow color, those plants will try to grow yellow as best as they can, those angiosperms, because that is going to attract the specific pollinator known as a bee that's going to allow for the pollination to happen and the dispersal of pollen via an animal route. So all of these things, color, structure, odor, whatever the plant sort of looks like, that look is to attract pollinators. And if it attracts pollinators well, or let's say if it flows with the wind well, it will be successful. And that's what we see in nature. In addition, in terms of diversity, um, many angiosperms rely on animal pollinators, as I've already said many times. So we'll, re we'll just write this down as many angiosperms, these flowering seed plants that live on land, rely on other things that live on land, and that's specifically animals, animal pollinators. So if an animal brushes by one of these flowers and some of the pollen rubs on it and then it goes to a different you know, flower, different field, and it rubs off that pollen on that flower, then we have a sort of a pollination event. Very basic pollination event, but still a pollination event nonetheless. That's an animal-mediated interaction. Now, of course, there are going to be some that are wind-pollinated. And when I say some, I mean some angiosperms are wind-pollinated. 
and if they are wind pollinated, we usually see these types of angiosperms present in dense populations. The populations are very, very dense. Everybody's very, very close to each other. Think, for example, grasses. Grasses are a classic, classic example of densely populated plants that are wind pollinated. So the wind is going to catch all of the pollen in this dense population and disperse it widely. Finally, last thing I want to mention, um, just so that we're aware, uh, when we talked about gymnosperms, just as a point of comparison, because it's very important to compare angio and gymno as we continue through this lecture, um, and gymnosperms were uh, exclusively wind pollinated. So they are, uh, they are wind pollinated. The wind is what's going to specifically pollinate gymnosperms. So the wind pollinates gymnosperms, whereas we have the potential of animal and wind pollinators in angiosperms. Thus, doesn't that make sense? You have the capabilities of animals helping you out, wind helping you out. That's going to obviously lead to more, you to having more success than your gymnosperm ancestors, let's say. And that covers angiosperms too. We completed the structure, and now we have a basic understanding of the diversity. We're going to be looking into great detail now the life cycle of these plants.